Hello, fellow Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. I am here with Clifton Duncan, and he is a true American hero. Now, if you're not familiar with his backstory, uh, this is going to absolutely fascinate you, but it's also going to give you, I think, some motivation and some inspiration. So first and foremost, Clifton, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks, George. Thanks for having me on. It's a wonderful invitation. I appreciate it. So before we went live here, I was telling you that I first was introduced to your story by our good buddy, Tom Woods. This was probably maybe a year and a half, two years ago. And uh, this was, in fact, I don't know if I told you this, but the main reason I started this channel, because I've got two channels, and this is the smaller one, but the main reason I started this in 2021 was to push back against the mandates. Oh, really? Interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. So on that note, can you kind of tell us your your backstory? What were you doing before 2020? And, uh, you know, tell us how you stood up for freedom and liberty. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a shy, nerdy army brat, but uh, somehow I went on to um, get into this really what I consider the best acting conservatory with the NYU graduate acting program. Got my MFA from there in 2009, right in the midst of the recession. So that, that was fun. But um, over the next decade, I built up a resume working around the country, doing everything from musical comedy to Shakespearean tragedy. And uh, eventually I landed, uh, I was doing plays off Broadway, landed on Broadway in a wonderful comedy called The Play That Goes Wrong, which Tom saw me in. And, yeah. um, and then after that, you know, it was uh, started breaking through in TV. I was basically swimming in um, these major circles and winning praise from people like Stephen Sondheim, legendary uh, composer and, um, and lyricist, um, people like Joel Gray, you know, just Tony Award winning people. So basically... It, I was on the rise. Uh, finally, right. I, I, I began. I begun to broke through. Yeah, your breakthrough. I should say you were on that 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 trajectory. Correct, correct. And uh, but then 2020 happened, and it was weird because you know I was in New York at the time, and I, I spent the first three months of 2020 being totally, totally into it. While, ever, while everyone else was focusing on Donald Trump's first impeachment. Um, I was stocking up on supplies and food and everything. Like I never had to scramble for toilet paper with grandma, basically. Um, <laughs> but then around uh, around April 2020 is when my mind began to change. I really began to ask questions. And I said to myself, you know, uh, we can't do this forever. And uh, I guess unlike all the other quote unquote artists, uh, I began to do a cost benefit analysis and, and really question what we were being told uh, about the pandemic. And uh, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and that really cemented everything for me. You know, in Central Park, they were walking around double masked. Um, but then in Piedmont Park in, in Midtown Atlanta, you know, it was like a normal day. People were having cookouts. You know, right. the, the kids are running around playing. People are playing cards and, and sharing beers and, and all kinds of um, other substances. And um, that's when I was like, this is, this is not, uh, you know, and there weren't mass deaths. And I looked before I came uh, down here. And you know, you mentioned freedom. And I said to myself, because part of my objection was about as, as a bleeding heart liberal really was about, you know, and an artist, you know, what are we doing to people? How are we affecting them psychologically and spiritually even? Um, so then March 2021 came around and that's when the industry wide vaccine mandates began to come out. And uh, my former manager, to their credit, they never tried to push me. But, you know, I began to get these availability checks and offers from other venues, you know, and they were asking, uh, do you plan on or have you already been uh, vaccinated against COVID? And the thing was, I had already recovered from COVID in December 2020, right before the uh, shots were rolled out. And I already knew that there's <clears throat> there's never been a successful uh, coronavirus vaccine. I already knew that. Um, and on top of that, there was, there was already a healthy uh, body of research uh, showing the robustness and, uh, and uh, strength of uh, naturally acquired immunity. Right. So, you know, and plus, I mean, the shots were just rolled out so quickly. You know, there were so many reasons that reasonable people just said, you know, I don't really, you know, if you want to take it, go for it, but just don't, just don't force it on me. Um, so basically, but the, in the entertainment industry specifically, it became, I'll call it a cult. I call it the COVIDian cult. And, um, you know, it was a big club and they they did, I won't use the, the, the term, but they inwardized people who didn't take the the shot. And I mean, that was that was the end of everything. Uh, my reputation was shot. My career was over. Um, 
my management dropped me. Um, I mean, I was of no use to them. I just couldn't work because I wouldn't get this shot. And um, it was very devastating. And there were many times where I just wanted to, you know, I mean, I'm 40 years old and waiting tables. I mean, I joke that normally what you do is that you wait tables until you make it. But then I made it and I went to waiting tables. My life makes no sense. Um, you know, but uh, so that's pretty much uh, my my story. And I became one of the only people uh, in the arts community at least, that had at least some kind of prominence that was saying, this is wrong. We're doing profound damage to not only just uh, to our industry, but society. And now all of those predictions have been borne out. Uh, box office um, for Broadway has not returned to its pre-pandemic levels. They hit record levels in 2018, 2019 season. Theaters across the country now are either truncating their seasons or they're closing uh, venues outright. Um, there were experts predicting, yeah, there were experts predicting that uh, the business will shrink by about half um, uh, by sometime this year. Um, one third of the audience has not returned pre-pandemic. And there was nobody else who was saying, nobody who was saying, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Now, meanwhile, you have uh, pro sports. I mean, we just saw the Super Bowl doing well. NBA is doing well. I went to a game the other night. I was like, this is electric. I love being here live with around people and feeling that sort of electricity and when being among uh, other humans. Um, but so sports is doing well, um, but the performing arts, specifically theater, uh, is not. And they did it to themselves and they wouldn't listen to anybody. You're talking, <laughs> excuse me, you're talking about doing a cost benefit analysis. And uh, I probably should have said right at the beginning of our conversation, but the main reason I brought you on today is to introduce people to your story because it's so inspiring, but also to tell them a project that you're doing that revolves around Thomas Sowell, the great Thomas yeah. Sowell. And so my question is, everyone else in your industry really didn't have that mindset, that cost benefit mindset, or as Thomas Sowell would say, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. Only trade-offs, right. So did you have that mindset as a result of reading Thomas Sowell, or has this been something that was more recent after you kind of had this red pill, pill moment? Yeah, well, you know, I, I discovered Sowell's work um, probably around 2015 or so. Okay. Um, and I think, I think the first book I read of his was, was uh, uh, White Rednecks and, no, uh, Black Rednecks and White Liberals, I think, I think yeah. is what the book is called. And uh, it totally changed my my view on on society and how it works. And then there was basic economics, um, which is another just fantastic book written for it. You know, so even that dummies like me can understand it. And um, you know, I, I think what really bothered me over time is again what you said: it's the trade off. Are we going to trade off um, this sense of security, you know, a false sense of security? for um, for these rights and our freedoms. And the thing about that is that, you know, you can you can learn, we, we learn how to live with viruses. We learn treatment protocols. We learn, you know, our bodies become uh, resistant to them. But in terms of, you know, giving the government or centralizing power into um, the, the government or, or the state, that is, that's a much, much more difficult thing to do. And now the precedent has been set that they can do it again anytime they want. And I said to myself, these artists, so-called artists, had spent the previous four years during the Trump administration um, talking about fascism and Nazism and everything, but then they became yeah. these totalitarian um, ideologues. It was insane to watch, but they just, they never ever um, considered, anything, uh, considered anything else. And, you know, and I think my understanding also of just basic, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm sort of, some sort of, you know, master level economist, but I think just my understanding of um, just base of, of the basics was was saying, well, okay, well, if you look at, if you incentivize people, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, the theater, they initially did these protocols where it's like, you know, everyone has to wear a mask and you can't do any backstage visits. I mean, you know, you're doing your Broadway show, but you can't invite your, your friends and family backstage to come celebrate with you. They said you can't do stage dooring anymore. That's a part of fan service, right? It helps the culture where you you come out of your show and people are there with their playbills. They want to be they want to talk to the actors. They, they want to you know, they want you know, they want your signature and all that other stuff. And so I said, OK, so we're giving up. Um, all of these aspects that make the theater worthwhile to not only participate in, but to come to. And we're doing it for a, a virus that has a over 99% survival rate. Um, so again, looking at trade-offs, what are we trading off? What's the cost benefit? 
and um, and no one was able to have this sort of mature conversation about yes, you know, some people are going to pass away, and it's very unfortunate. Um, but we also have to a life has to go on. We have to weigh what life is going to look like for the people that are still here. Um, so you know, it was it was really a it was shocking to me. It was just shocking to me that it seemed that nobody, at least publicly, almost nobody, um, had any kind of mindset that would that would say to them, "Look, you know, we are we are artists, and especially in New York City, right? It's it's like the cultural center of the universe, and all these artists were saying that we're not essential. How how does that even work? I mean, as much as you know, one of the first things people do when they come to New York is like they, they say, "Let's go see a Broadway show." So the performing arts people come from all over the world. To both to see and to be in shows in New York City, how is that not to, essential? I used to do that all the time. There, there you go, there you go, and they and they don't realize that uh, that you know, I mean, it's it's part of the, it's it's part of the cultural identity of the city is yeah, its right. arts. You know what I mean? I mean, even the museum business, right? It's just it's cutthroat there. No one's messing around in New York City, and so the fact that all these artists sat back and said we're not essential, we're less essential than the, the corner liquor store. Um, was was really shocking to me, and I think now they're bearing the fruit of their short sightedness. Unfortunately, yeah, I think it's even more simple than that, right? You don't have to read any of Thomas Sowell's books on economics to know that if you completely shut down the economy for a year, that's probably not a good thing. Well, like, can I? Can I <laughs> well, can I cut in because because and that's what also pissed me off, right? Because they called you selfish, right? If you said we should focus on these things, first of all, these people said, you know, you're putting uh, if you focus on the economy, you're only putting profit over people, which is, you know, I guess Pfizer's profits were were fine to put over people, but that's that's aside the point, right? It's what you were saying, the whole interconnectedness, you know, the sort of ecosystem. I said, you know, Broadway or the theater, it it employs, uh, you know, snack vendors, it employs bartenders, concession workers, uh, retailers. Um, the businesses in the surrounding area get all that foot traffic, right? So at 6 p.m. or so around in Midtown Manhattan, you know, all you, you see these lines, people trying to get tickets, but there's like souvenir shops and bodegas and restaurants and delis that in the surrounding area that get that benefit if Broadway's doing well. And so it's not just about you all. It's about the entire sort of ecosystem of, of New York. And like you, we are, or I should say they, but these performers are essential to that. And the fact that they could, they didn't understand what that, they don't even know what an economy is. They just couldn't get it. So it's, it was just so bizarre to me and frustrating. And unfortunately, the, the fast forward, even to today, the poor and middle class are disproportionately paying the price for those lockdowns from a standpoint of consumer price inflation. You know, that's, that's one thing that I do get into quite extensively. And uh, one of the main reasons we saw the CPI go up to 9%, which understates inflation back in 2022, is because of the supply chain disruption. So you've got a person that's making, let's say, just working um, or living paycheck to paycheck. That 9% inflation or 15 or whatever it was is going to have a massive impact on their overall purchasing power and their standard of living. Whereas if you're making $250,000 a year, okay, a 9% bump in your grocery bill isn't really going to affect you one way or the other. And that's something that people are going to be paying for for unfortunately for a long time to come in addition to all the other economic distortions that you were referring to. Yeah, and it was so offensive to me because, you know, I would see these stories about gym owners, restaurant owners, um, you know, salon owners, barbers or whatever, who were fighting their own governments to stay open and feed their right. families and, you know, and take care of themselves. Meanwhile, these pretentious, pampered, quote unquote, progressives were demanding the government pay them not to work. And I'm saying to myself, you know, I mean, I never supported the, uh, the stimulus bill because I'm like, we're printing all of this money. And that's going to have uh, effects down the road. And now at a, at a time where, you know, I mean, I want, I think theater should be for everybody. The arts should be for everybody. It should be accessible to everybody. And what they've done with, um, again, their short-sighted policy is, uh, you know, now people can't even afford to go to theater, which was already expensive in the first place. So you've made the theater even less accessible to the people that you most want to be in the theater. You right. know what I mean? Like they just, they, they, they couldn't, they, they didn't think about any of this stuff. They didn't think about any of it because they just don't know. And I, I, I don't want to use um, derogatory terms, but it's just, uh, you know, it's not 
they're not the sharpest tools in the shed. I just have to say that it's just it's you know, and the fact that they couldn't think about that, and now they're wondering why people aren't at their shows. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, it's people. People would if they if people could choose um, in terms of entertainment between staying home and watching Netflix, which costs them you know fifteen, seventeen dollars a month, versus paying fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, a hundred dollars per ticket to go see a Broadway show or an off Broadway show. Guess what they're going to do when they're already paying more for gas, utilities and right. all other consumer goods like they just they they don't understand any of this stuff. And if you try to explain this to them, then, you know, you're some you're some capitalist uh, right wing maniac. They just don't get it. They don't know anything. It's so yeah. it makes me so you could tell it makes me really mad. <laughs> well, it goes back to Thomas Sowell and he always talks about unintended consequences. Right. Or what I mean, emerges. Yeah. All you got to do is just do some trade offs, simple cost benefit analysis. Look at the um, uh, look at uh, the unintended consequences, or it just acknowledge that there could be unintended consequences <laughs> to something that extreme, for heaven's sakes. And then the other thing I would add is the slippery slope. When even it, when I was debating people back during that time frame, even if they had a level of uh, of uh, a level of intellectual honesty let's say to where they would consider those things they they would never look at okay well what type of precedence does this set for the central planners and the government moving forward and the example that i would use and i don't know if you, you've heard this you might find this interesting is the example of 1905 and this it was um right the top of my head is either jacobson versus massachusetts or ferguson i think it was jacobson versus Massachusetts, where uh, they basically said that this guy was supposed to take uh, a vaccine and he didn't take it. So they didn't force him to take it, but they made him pay like a, what was the equivalent of like a hundred dollar fine or something, you know, during a, a smaller pandemic of that time frame. And so what happened is he said, fine, I'll pay the fine. That's why he took it to court. But then if we fast forward to, I believe it was 1927, it's either 27 or 29, and that's when they had the ruling for Buck versus Bell. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but that's where they basically legalized eugenics in the United States, uh, where this gal, they, they, you know, they're criticizing her level of intellect. So they uh, basically forced sterilization on her and this is the Supreme Court that did this. Uh, so she wouldn't be able to populate the world with any more, I think, imbeciles is the term that they used. And the justification for legalizing eugenics in the United States was that Jacobson or Ferguson versus Massachusetts decision in 1905. So that shows you the type of slippery slope that you can get on that, yes, you may not pay a penalty for now, but future generations, you know, 20 years, 30 years down the road will have to suffer the consequences. Yeah. You know, I mean, again, the the lack of foresight uh, among people, you know, because I my thing was, OK, well, I, I, I made a joke. I said, you know, I hope that uh, that Donald Trump gets back into office. And he begins mandating vaccines left and right, uh, uh, because then you can't say anything. You can't right. then you can't complain because you already acquiesced to it before. Exactly. You know? So what are you going to do? And also just the fact that um, I, it was I don't know where you were at emotionally during that time. But I mean, it was on top of the the vitriol against people who didn't uh, who'd opted out of the vaccine. But just the idea that people were willing to give up. Um, all the things that make life meaningful for a protracted, indefinite period of time right. and to allow the government to dictate who was essential and who was not, to dictate what you could wear on your face, to dictate what you inject into your body, to dictate that your kids can't go to school, all these things that they willingly gave, uh, they they surrendered their their personal autonomy to the government. I said, well, they can do it again now. They can do it again. And the and social media, these these tech giants can uh, can censor how you talk about it. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry can just push out anything they want. And these uh, and the state can say you have to take this. And now the precedent is set because you didn't say anything. Not enough people stood up and said, no, we're not doing this. And, yeah. uh, you know, so if a big bad Republican gets back into office, 
I don't want to hear them say anything because they want it. This, this is the world that they created. And there were so many people that, um, you know, messaged me privately. And, uh, you know, one in particular I'm thinking about who's, you know, in a Broadway show right now, a hit, a hit show, one of the few hit shows. And um, he was like, hey, man, I, I agree with you. But, you know, I, you know, he just had a baby and they just bought a new house and yada, yada, yada. And it's just like, OK, like I get that. But what kind of world are you are you leaving behind for your your children now? Your children will now have to live under the constant threat of any administration, any government body saying you have to take this thing, whether you need it or not, whether you want it or not, whether it's going to be good for you or not. You can't say anything about it because you'll be censored or you'll be canceled or whatever. So again, it's just the, the, the complete lack of consideration of precedent, as you were saying, uh, it's just, it's just mind boggling to me. Yeah. Well, let's, let's move on to some more encouraging <laughs> topics here, Clifton, because you know, what's interesting, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but I retired in 2012 uh, when I was 38 years old. Wow, and congrats. so a lot of people kind of asked me or have asked me in the past, you know, kind of advice and, well, what was your three-year, five-year, 10-year plan? How did you achieve those objectives? And I said, you know, honestly, I didn't really have a, a long-term plan at all because when I got out of college, everyone said, yeah, you got to, you know, set these objectives and whatnot. You have to define them or else you're not going to achieve them. But what I noticed is every three year period, if I look back on the three years past, like if I would rewind, let's say I was in 2003, I rewind to 2000. Um, and then I would have told myself that I'd be doing what I was doing three years later. I never would have believed it. And, it, and it's it's been like that you know, since the, uh, the very beginning. And so, um, can you go ahead and tell us kind of what you're doing now to, uh, get to a point where, and you probably never would have thought you you'd been here. And what I was saying earlier is every single time I, I had something catastrophic at the time, what I thought was catastrophic happened to me when I look back in three years, that was always the best thing that could have happened. So I, I'm assuming that what happened to you by taking you off of that trajectory, now that you look back in retrospect, based on the things that you're doing, was probably the best thing that happened. So if you could explain that and how you felt during that process, and then get us up to speed as to what you're doing today that's so exciting. Well, yeah, it's it's really bizarre. I mean, you know, I, on on a smaller level, I think about uh, you know when I was in college and doing uh, and doing shows, and they actually stopped casting me because I kept getting into shows, and they were like, you know, someone else has to get a chance. So there's your equity for you. But um, yeah, but I, but then I just ended up finding work in the community, and I ended up nailing the first um, professional audition that I had, and I ended up going to grad school. Yada yada yada. Uh, you know, the best the best program in the nation. Um, and so with. There, there's been a recurring pattern in in my life I've noticed where you know if I get dropped from an agency by you know for instance I mean I, I've been cut from a couple of them but then I wound up with like a super powerful manager you know what I mean so it 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 the the out of the ashes somehow you know I kind of managed to rise but with this um, I literally was like I have no future um, you know I'm I'm 40 years old and I'm I'm waiting tables with people half my age my I'm older than my bosses who are also dumb you know I just you know and I I'd, I'd be because I, you know, I never learned any other skills. I never needed to learn any other skills. You know, outside of singing better, and uh, and knowing how to uh, knowing how to uh, work my way, or you know, just not look like a dumbass on screen, on camera, uh, or on stage. And so that was my skill set. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And you know, my life is pretty much over. But at the same time, what was interesting is that I began to notice that, um, you know, because there were so many things happening in 2020. And I just felt compelled to just like say something like I, I it was physically impossible for me not to speak out against this stuff. And I had this, you know, I have my anonymous Twitter account where, you know, I air my true opinions. And then my, my public account, my former public account was like, uh, hey, I guys, know. <laughs> come, you know, yeah, I was like, hey, guys, come see me in my show. Got it. And no one cared about that, you know, which, no, which was fine. But once I, I but then I, I began another Twitter account under my own name and began speaking what I really think. And I ended up meeting some of the right people and getting on some shows. Like I got, I was on Tim Pool's show and on, and on trigonometry. And, um, 
you know, and I think Twitter specifically caters to my strengths because I'm kind of a smart ass and I can really, um, I can really communicate things in a condensed, in a condensed way, right. which really uh, is helpful for that format. But over time, what I began to notice is that my following just kept growing and growing and growing. And over time, people were like, yeah, you, you start a podcast. And I was like, oh, all right, whatever. You know, and I waited for months and months. Like, what am I going to call it? And finally, I just said, you know, the Clifton Duncan podcast, whatever, we'll do it. And because of my Twitter following and my network had expanded, I was able to get just amazing guests like Douglas Murray or Victor Davis Hanson and talk about the arts mm. and um, just fantastic, incredible guests. I mean, I, I look back on the catalog, I still can't believe it. Um, and just over time, I, I just began to commit to this idea that I'm going to be this sort of accidental influencer um, or, you know, a content creator, whatever you want to call it. And so... I began to study things like copywriting and rhetoric and persuasion. Um, um, I'm learning more about business and marketing and these types of things um, in order to build. Because I said, you know, if I can't be in the industry, I'll find a way to become bigger than the industry. Because I think I have go. a lot to offer to to the world in that in that regard. And I think these um, these institutions are failing anyway because again, they're trapped in this ideology in this free fall. I mean, you know, the theater is like, I call it the San Francisco of the performing arts industry. <laughs> um, you know, it's just in this doom loop. And, but so, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to learn. I mean, it's also like technical stuff and algorithms and, you know, how to really get your message out there, become a strong communicator. And, but at the same time, you know, in my training program at NYU, uh, the graduate acting program, at the end of the of the three year program, they have this uh, pro they have this not really an assignment, but it's sort of a festival called Free Play, and it really is a platform. If you want to think of it as maybe a dissertation, uh, maybe the, the equivalent that's kind of that's kind of fine. But you know, I had classmates who wrote a whole musical. They're writing you know one act plays, so I wrote a one man show that was very autobiographical, lots of hip hop, lots of singing, lots of characters. What and year was this put in? This was 2009. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and it actually got me my first agent. I had, I had an agent before I even graduated from, from the program. Um, and you know, it just, it was very well received. I got to do it at a, at a, uh, off Broadway festival in another uh, theater as well in New York. And, um, so that sort of, and in the program itself, our part of our training was learning how to create our own work. Um, in, in a very, but not just sitting at a typewriter or something and just, you know, figuring something out, but really in a visceral, playful, fun, um, um, heightened manner, I mean, sort of the trademark of the actors from that program. And so a few years ago, I had this idea because, you know, there's there's a one man show about uh, Paul Robeson that James Earl Jones did back in the 70s. There's another one man show called Thurgood about Thurgood Marshall, which uh, uh, which Lawrence Fishburne did back in 2011. You can, you can actually still watch it on Amazon Prime. I think it was uh, nominated for like three primetime Emmys. Um, and there was another show I saw off Broadway with a wonderful actor named John Douglas Thompson, who did a show called Satchmo at the Waldorf, which is about Louis Armstrong. And that one was really interesting because he played not just not just Louis Armstrong, but he also played Miles Davis. He also played Satchmo's manager, um, some some white guy. And um, this black actor, which is really, really fascinating. And it's just fun for from an audience perspective. It's just fun to watch. And I said to myself, you know, what if Thomas Sowell was a subject of one of these kinds of shows? You know what I mean? Um, and I, I, you know, good and well that, uh, you know, nobody in the industry knows who he is, or if they do, they denigrate him because they never read it. They never really read his work. Right. And, um, and I just said, you know what, man? And, and Tom Woods, you know, to his credit was very um, instrumental in kind of pushing me forward. And he says, just go for it. Like, you know, just launch it, do it. And um, so a few days ago, I, I started a crowdfunding campaign for uh, for Soul. I don't know what the title's going to be yet, but uh, you know, I, I said I just need I, I need some time to really immerse myself in the subject, do some research, excuse me, research and immersion, and to create a a script in the way that um, my my training taught me. And um, and so now we there's a crowd, there's an active Indiegogo campaign for Thomas Soul. Um, this one man show. And uh, it's you're going to be doing. I want to be very, very clear that uh, right. Clifton is going to be doing a one man show based on Thomas Sowell. Now, I don't know if it's going to be the life of Thomas or maybe one or two of his books. That'll be interesting how you kind of piece that all together. Yeah. But what's so inspiring is you took all or a lot of the skills that you've learned throughout your entire life, you know, going back to 2009 and that one man show that you did then. And now you're able to implement it, but 
doing so in a way where you stay true to your principles. Yeah, yeah. And at well, the end of the day, that that's that's all we got. And you know, throughout, uh, uh, we'll call it the Cerveza sickness. I always say that to keep it YouTube friendly. But throughout, you know, there were some ups and downs there. Where even Tom Woods admits that at the beginning, he didn't know what was going on. I mean, none of us did, right? So you're like, well, maybe, maybe we do need to restrict people's ability to go. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not a virologist or whatever. But if you would just stay true to your principles throughout that whole process you would have made the right decision nine out of 10 times as far as being on the right side of history. And it's just really exciting that you get to do this. Well, you know, a, a part of my journey, um, well, first of all, it's the idea of sticking with reality and with facts um, and and saying what the truth is, no matter how unpopular it makes you. And all these traits, you know, are, are you know, people, Thomas Sowell is renowned for doing all of these things. Um, another compelling aspect of his story is that he changed his mind. He was a diehard Marxist uh, for the first part of his life. And then he, even after studying with Milton Friedman, he, he was still a diehard Marxist. And then, uh, you know, he, he, he one just- One job was, in the government. One summer. Right, one, one job in the government. You know what I mean? It was, it was enough to change his mind. So, um, you know, and, uh, and his sort of ideological shift really mirrors my own from about 2014, 2015, where I was sort of on the same path and then, you know, I began to really change my my mind about things, partly because of because of his work, um, and you know, it's just it's a very it's very interesting as well in terms of my my skill set because you know he's a very powerful speaker and communicator, obviously, and you know my background in Shakespeare will help because I I imagine it'll be a very text heavy show, but you know the 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 idea is to really get underneath the skin of this person and not just have some kind of standard kind of bio play because you can go to Wikipedia for that maybe right. or read one of his books you know the, the the idea is how can you bring this person to life in an exciting entertaining and timeless way and so I'm, I'm reading about Jung Jungian psychology and like Joseph Campbell and symbols and archetypes like how can we really really make this a powerful powerful piece of, um, of theater and not just a sort of flimsy Oh, you know, here's the story of Thomas Sowell. You know what I mean? And there's so many directions to go. I mean, I sing as well, so that could be a part of it. Um, you know, you might see appearances from other characters, including Milton Friedman, which, would, again, from the audience perspective, if I think about it from the quote unquote consumer perspective, what would be fun to watch? And, you know, the six foot three black guy um, I mean, Milton Friedman. magically Milton transforming Friedman, like, into Milton Friedman. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? But that's, you know, and and for it and to and to have the power because um, you when you're talking about the art, the artistic process, what you're really talking about is um, on certain a certain level. And Rick Rubin talks about this, the uh, the famous producer. Um, you know, you're really trying to. It's really akin to magic. And how can you build that illusion for people that wow, this person really is making me believe that they're Milton Friedman. They're making me believe that they're Thomas Sowell. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's you know Clarence Thomas not making an appearance. The belief is that the technical term for it, like movies and whatnot. The, the suspension of disbelief, correct. That's right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so there, there's so many ways to go. And also just in terms of, um, I mean, he clashed, his belief system clashes a lot with, um, you know, our, our modern civil rights leaders. So, yeah. you know, my, Michael, Malcolm X might make an appearance. MLK might make an appearance. Uh, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, all these kinds of people. There's so much as possible in, in terms of contrasting you know, who, who soul is and his own development and his life versus, you know, wider society. So there's, there's so many ways you can go that will make it so much more interesting and impactful than just a standard, like this happened and then this happened and then this happened to him again. And then this happened, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm really, um, I'm really, really excited about just diving in and seeing how I can use all of myself and all of my skills and, uh, to really create something that's really, um, um, that's very memorable. That's going to be awesome. I don't know if you know this, but his he he always says that his true passion in life was photography. Oh, interesting. So he, he's got the soul of an artist, basically. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, I've heard him say on multiple occasions that if he had it to do all over again, he, he might have actually chosen to be a photographer instead of an, a, an economist. That is fantastic. And, it's, and again, it's just a wonderful piece of um, of. It, it's something that that really humanizes him and gives him depth and dimension. I mean, I love. There's also the story which I, I haven't read about yet, but um, you know, of, of him, his children or one of his children was um, was a late talker, and 
there's something about that that's so humanizing. We think of this person as this sort of intellectual giant, but he's got this 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 obstacle, right? Part of drama is the obstacle. What do I want and um, and what's in my way? And what do I do to overcome it? So there's all these humanizing aspects of his character, which you know you can draw from to to again give the piece. Um, it's not just the x-axis, right? It's the y and the z-axis to give it depth and scope um, yeah. of, of the character. So there's so many possibilities, and uh, you know I'm just really looking forward to diving into all these kinds of stories and um, and how you can make a really um, really exciting piece of theater and share it with it and share it with everybody. That's that's the that's the other key point is sharing it. Yeah, Clifton, I apologize for looking down at my phone, but I really want to share with you. I mean, there's so many just incredible quotes from from Thomas Sowell, which I'm sure you've read. But there's one that I uh, I should memorize it, but I always just put it on my phone and read it just because I'm lazy. <laughs> but this, I think it really pertains, is one of my favorite quotes, but it also really pertains to what you had to experience in 2020. In 2021, due to these central planners, authoritarians, basically people who thought they were smarter than the dumb rubes in society, the average Joe and Jane, that they weren't capable of making their own decisions. So we, the global elite, need to do it for you. Here's Thomas Sowell. There is usually only a limited amount of damage that can be done by dull or stupid people. For creating a truly monumental disaster, you need people with high IQs. Yeah, yeah. But there's another variation on that, Reese. Something about uh, you know high IQ and low information is a very deadly combination. Yeah. Um, you know, and and just going back a little bit, you know, once I reading a work like A Conflict of Visions, which Soul said is one of his most important works, it really, yeah, it's really constrained. It's it's uh, it's it's one of those books that really highlights why the response to the pandemic turned out the way that it did. Yeah. Because people on the ground were saying, I don't know. I mean, here in Georgia, they were like, yeah, I don't know. They, they seem to kind of be hyping it up. And like, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the plumber that, that I have come by, you know, smart guy, he got it right away and was like, there's something off about this. Right. But all these quote unquote elites, I call them garbage people, but uh, you know, quote unquote elites um, just couldn't get it. And they thought that they were smarter than everybody else. And they didn't trust the sort of, cumulative knowledge um, of the masses. They they said, you know, we're going to put all of our faith in this sort of unconstrained vision into all these experts and and these sort of this sort of unelected clergy of people. And again, it just goes to show you um, Sowell's, um, his prescience and his insight into not just economics, but into the human condition at large. Right, right. Yeah. Can you explain to uh, everyone watching kind of your goal isn't just a, a play because when I think of a play, I just think of, you know, something on Broadway or maybe in one of these uh, urban markets that you go downtown, but what you're trying to turn this into and what I think you'll have huge success in doing is more so like a, a touring comedian. So I think of Russell Brand, you know, he goes out there and talks on his show on his YouTube channel his podcast and whatnot. But he's doing that in a way to promote his stand-up comedy, or then he goes to, uh, you know, town X Y Z on Monday night, then town A B C on Wednesday, then Friday, and you're going all around the United States, uh, almost like a stand-up comedian doing this incredible show and introducing more and more people to the ideas of Thomas Sowell. Can you kind of go over that game plan? Yeah. So for the next six months, the plan is to just uh, is to develop the the show, develop the script, and uh, have a great line producer is going to keep me on task. And um, I've already got other um, some other colleagues who will help me shape it, um, shape the play. <clears throat> and what the plan is after that is to tour the show around the country. There's already been multiple people who said, you know, come do it um, at this theater, come to, come to this town, because what happens is that the audience is who teaches you how to do the play. So mm. just as just as uh, how stand up comedians, when they're trying out new material, they'll be like, guys, it's not going to be good yet. I mean, Chris Rock does this. All the great comedians do this where they're, you know, they, they try out new stuff for small audiences or whatever. And they find out, you know, what what bits are working and what does not, you know. And as an actor, you learn over time, you know, once you once you once you finish the rehearsal period, then you're in previews. 
and that's where you you learn okay the the pace is kind of sagging here a little bit or you know i can i can feel them checking out here or this line gets a laugh every time if i deliver it like this at, with this particular inflection yeah. so you learn these little these little bits of nuance and also just the the, the sheer repetition of re, of doing the show you get more skilled at doing it yeah um so and what's great is that um i i would love to tour it around to uh, you know a bunch of various towns because what what happens is that um you you not only build momentum and people are talking about it, but you're also getting them excited to come to theater again, which they've been um, they've they've been pushed out of for the past decade, really, due to politics. And um, so the plan is to tour it, and then once it's nice and honed, then upload it to the internet for the world to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the most exciting part because then. A, you've already toured it and you've already sort of built word of mouth and momentum by it, uh, about it. And then, you know, you've gotten it into the the tip top shape that you that you can, you know, put it in. You're, you're revising, you're editing, you're 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 figuring it out. And um, then here it is online so that the rest of the world can access it. And that's a really exciting aspect of it, too. So there's a um, so the developmental process in terms of touring it around, that's a part of it because the audience teaches you how to do the play. And um, again, that's what's exciting about live theater is that, uh, you know, the audience becomes another character, essentially. Mm. And um, and there's just a and again, I go back to I can't believe that they shut it down for so long because they, you cut that connection and you rob people of that in, that 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 uh, in-person electricity and connection. I mean, just literally the you know, the the sound of your voice um, through through waves is hitting other people in the space and you know they can see you sweat they can they can they sh they're sharing your breath they're sharing your your molecules you know what i mean there's something that's electric about that and that and that connects people in a way that no other art form does and so that's a really exciting aspect of it as well and then on top of that we're sort of we're, we're sharing these ideas and uh, and and introducing people perhaps to um, awesome. to one of the great thinkers of the 20th and 21st centuries absolutely how can we support you, Clifton? Um, well, there's a, there's an Indiegogo campaign. You can go to uh, www.soulplay.com. That's S O uh, S O W E L L play.com. Um, we I set a goal for ten thousand dollars. We've already exceeded that. Uh, it's it, we're at two hundred and eighty three percent of uh, of the goal. Last <laughs> after, time I checked, after so, how many days? After just a few, like well, I announced. I did the big announce yesterday. And um, so just in one day, we raised over twenty five thousand dollars, That's um, awesome. which is which that is, is awesome. unbelievable. We have over two hundred and eighty backers right now, um, you know, and if you you know, there's different tiers. There's a hundred dollar tier, uh, five hundred dollars, a thousand and five thousand if you want to be a co-producer on it. Um, but if you can't pay that much, you know, you, you can sign up for my um, my sub stack, which is uh, uh, the state of the arts. That's cliftonduncan.substack.com. You can sign up at locals as well to um, to keep in touch. So you know there, there's a bunch of different ways. And I'm really and people people have left comments and said you know I can't give much right now or I can't give anything. And I'm saying you know what man your, your vibes are good. We got a lot of we got a lot of people uh, support already. Um, and the the goal really is it's beside the money. It's really about just getting people on board and and sort of participating in the process of a of creation of a new work. So there's so much support right now. I can't, I almost can't believe it. Um, I almost don't want to think about it too much because, uh, you know, it becomes a, a daunting task. You got to put the money where the mouth is. But just the fact that there is such widespread support, not only for this particular project, but it's also great because people need to invest more in the arts. Um, and you, you can't complain that the quote, the quote unquote left or whatever is, you know, owns everything, or you can't right. complain about the, the direction of the culture without, without, um, without investing in people who are creating a new culture. So it's, it's exciting on many, many levels. Definitely. Absolutely. Well, and I was just going to say, and it shows your fellow performers that they don't have to make a decision as to whether or not to follow their principles or keep their job. They, they don't have to make that decision anymore. You know, they can give the the establishment the middle finger if they want, because they know that they can still put a roof over their head or put food on the table. Well, well, here's here's a difficulty, George, is that, you know, actors, um, I mean, they're they're temporary employees, basically. They're independent contractors and they're always at the whim of whatever their agents, if they have an agent, 
whatever their agents can negotiate with the production company, the studio or whatever, the theater. And it, it's it's very easy. I mean, I was very excuse me. I was very lucky because I was auditioning a lot and I had a great, great manager who was just, you know, getting me um, opportunities left and right. Um, but the thing is, you can become very passive in that in that kind of life. And what and what most actors do once they reach a certain point is, you know, they might be living off of residuals from television work. Um, you know, they might do a concert or, or a developmental reading here and there. But a lot of them just take um, unemployment benefits and they live on those. And, um, you know, I stopped doing that just off of principle because I was like, you know, I'm going to try to force myself to kind of figure it out. And right. luckily I was able to do that. But um, so basically, like there's a great author named Michael Shirtliff who wrote a, a book called Audition. And, and one of the <laughs> one of the standout lines is that 80 percent of actors are lazy and are lazy are lazy. Okay. And it's, I mean, and it's just, it's the truth really. I mean, I, I hate to say that, but, but it is, you can be very passive and sort of, you know, I think the people who are at the, the top and stay at the top for decades, they're, they're very hardworking, but those, that's why they're the top kind of, you know, one or 2% of the industry that, that, that those are your DiCaprio's your Denzel Washington's, mm -hmm. you know, so on and so forth, your Tom Cruise's so on and so forth. You know, th there's a reason that they're there and they stay there. You know, Clint East was another example of someone who, you know, really made his own career basically. Um, but most people just don't have that drive and, you know, and the older that I got, especially I, I got kind of tired of being sort of, you know, told what to do because there's a, this huge pressure to like, you know, to conform and to like be nice and to be liked because your reputation and your relationships are very, um, are, you know, sort of help build and sustain a career. And right. if you're considered difficult or whatever, then uh, that can cause real problems for you. And when you're talking about an industry that's been completely ensorcelled, so to speak, by this one ideological perspective um, that just is completely, that, 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 that keeps moving further and further away from reality, then that becomes a problem for you. And that's, and that's why I think people had to sort of they sort of conformed to all of the um, the pandemic protocols because they were already demoralized from having to accept things like preferred pronouns and these kinds of things. So, um, it's you death know, by it, a thousand cuts, death by a thousand cuts to, to the psyche, to the spirit, to yeah. one sense of truth. And um, but when and but for years, I've been like, what if there's another way to go about it? What if there is something else, you know, what if everyone else is doing it wrong? Because what happens is, you know, you, you graduate from one of these programs and, you know, it's lucky because you're 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 up on the ladder a little bit um, as opposed to everyone else, because you have all these major casting people and studios. I mean, I was taking meetings with like Warner Brothers and, and CBS and everything before I got out of school. But um, you're still at the bottom of the ladder and people just say, you know, take a number, get in line. Sooner or later, your competition dies. You know, it's, it's as much about timing as it is about talent, you know, these kinds of things. And I'm like, dude, what if there's another way to go about this? And yeah. I began to see just looking online, my favorite YouTubers were kind of, you know, building their own um, building their own businesses. And I had friends who were like, yeah, you know, I, I had a screen test for this role, but they gave it to some bimbo with two million followers. And I'm thinking to myself, that could be you. That could be us. You have mm -hmm. the looks, the, the, the charisma, the training. You know, but uh, there's a real snobbishness uh, or a snobbishness about this. And they say, you know, I don't want to add an ex-girlfriend. He said, I don't want to get famous like that. And um, I'm like, well, maybe you're unemployed now, but I just raised uh, five figures by um, by putting out an offer um, of something people actually might want to watch. So <laughs> while and, and while the industry is failing at large. So, you know, if I could maybe be a, a model of a new way forward um, for artists, um, then that's kind of cool as well. Again, I mean, it wouldn't it, 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 it would. Uh, it would make just as little sense to me as everything else that's happened. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but everything happens for a reason, man. True, it, True. it happens for a reason, and I'm just so glad that uh, you're able to pursue your your passions in a principled way, and that we're all going to be able to benefit from that, and that uh, more and more people are going to find out and discover just how incredible Thomas Sowell and his ideas are. That, that's. I just I've always said that, you know, he really changed my life uh, when I when I retired in 2012. I didn't know anything about economics. I didn't know what the Fed was. I didn't know what the yield. I mean, absolutely nothing. And uh, I watched Free to Choose that series. I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen it. Milton Friedman. Right. Yeah. Back in the uh, 70s, 80s. And um, somehow. Oh, you know what? At the end of one of his shows, you know how he did that little debate in the library. I think it was at the University of Chicago. He actually had Thomas Sowell in one of those debates. 
and that's when I was first introduced to uh, to Soul. And then I kind of just went down that rabbit hole with all of his books. So uh, this is just really, really something cool. So uh, one more time, Clifton, could you give people your your Substack or maybe your Twitter handle, whatever is the best way to follow you and keep up to date as to what you're doing? Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, George. It's been a wonderful conversation. Um, so if you want to support the uh, the Soul crowdfunding campaign, you can go to www.soulplay.com. That's uh, S-O-W-E-L-L-P-L-A-Y.com. Um, you can support me on the Substack. That's cliftonduncan.substack.com. My Substack is called The State of the Arts, kind of a play on words there. And uh, you can find me on Twitter, which is my largest platform. Um, at uh, It's at Clifton A. Duncan. So you can find me on one of those platforms and uh, reach out and um, offer support. And uh, you'll, you know, you'll find you'll find me um, chucking flamethrowers <laughs> <laughs> online um, somehow. But uh, you know, you, you, all support is very much appreciated. Um, there's been a, an overwhelming amount of support so far. People are really, really excited about it, and I'm excited to dive into the process and create something that uh, that's meaningful to them. Awesome, Clifton. Thanks for your time, buddy. I can't wait to do it again. It's totally been a pleasure, George. Thank you.